Maria Father in heaven, thank you for your mercies upon us and thank you for your grace. The Lord, we need to hear your voice speak to us and uh, lead us into the path of righteousness. And so let these studies move us closer to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. And so once again, uh, I would like to welcome all of us to the presentation of today, which is um, um, we are going through uh, the human nature of Christ. I'll say uh, we are going through this First human nature, as we continue going through the Minneapolis um, uh, 1888 and the messages that the Lord uh, wanted his children to have, and the, then the delegates um, go to spread this message. We are told that um, uh, within uh, two years, the message could have been uh, spread and Christ could have come to take his charge. And so uh, I'm just going through some of the things that uh, were being uh, voiced at that time that uh, we may be able to look at them. We may be able to uh, interact with information and uh, whatever we can uh, hold ourselves accountable to the truth or uh, um, the faith once delivered to the saints, then uh, we can be able to go and uh, spread the same message and not only the same message but what the lord is willing us to be able to spread to the whole world and so i uh, welcome to this uh, presentation and uh, i'll go straight to the presentation and uh, when you go through the the book uh, christ and his righteousness uh, by ej wagner you will uh, find this i uh, will find uh, uh, what I'm just about to share with you. We have a publisher's preface. How shall we consider Christ? Is Christ God? Christ as a creator? Is Christ a created being? God manifest in the flesh? Important practical lessons. Then uh, we have Christ the lawgiver, the righteousness of God, the Lord, our righteousness, accepting with God, the victory of faith born servants and free men, practical illustration of deliverance from bondage. And so what I want us to understand is that um, whenever we tackle any subject, the main theme should be how will it impact our work with the Lord. There is no doctrine that is so much important that really cuts off Christ from the picture. When we have doctrines that um, Christ is not represented as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, then uh, the message is devoid of the power that uh, it should have. But then every message we have, be it prophetic, be it uh, our form in health and grace, we should be thinking not of how uh, we shall be viewed ourselves as good, but how we shall represent Christ as the atonement for uh, our sins and uh, our shortcomings. And so every doctrine, every phase of uh, our doctrine and every feature of our work should be marked with uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, who is our atoning sacrifice. And as we look at, um, we looked at um, the uh, divine nature of Jesus Christ, where we saw that uh, his divine nature was for the atonement of sin not only for those who have fallen into sin, but even for the other worlds which have not uh, fallen into sin, and even for the angels, they ascribe glory and praises unto him because they are kept from apostasy by looking at the crowning art at Calvary. So we saw that the meditorial work not only covers this um, uh, world, this planet earth, but also it covers uh, the unfallen world and heaven because uh, heaven must be purified with things which are better than the things of the earth. And angels being of higher nature and the inhabitants of the other world being of higher nature, they could not be atoned with the blood of lambs and gods which are of the lower nature. 
then also the character of God, which is divine, for it to be atoned for and preserved, it needs a person with a higher nature. And that is why Christ's divine nature was for atonement. And his human nature, we shall see that it is for our example that we may be able to understand that uh, we can overcome sin. And so this is my my this is my whole burden. And uh, I pray that uh, it may come out uh, as the Lord will wish it, not as I will want to present it. And so in uh, Youth Instructor, October 13, 1898, paragraph 6, there's something we are told that uh, the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. Um, it is the golden chain. Um, sorry, just a moment. Uh, Uh, the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. That is the humanity of the Son of God. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humanity in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place we are on, Thou standest is holy ground. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a conrad heart. And uh, the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for the hidden truth. So we find that um, there are some things which are hidden which will need us to go further and dig deep so that uh, we may be able to find. Uh, uh, the truth there in their things which are uh, deep and um, they they will need us to go beyond uh, surface reading and uh, 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 seeing the shaft beyond uh, the surface reading that we always do. And we are told that um, when uh, we do this, we shall be repaid. When we do this, we shall be repaid. And so this is not something that um, we should shun from studying the human nature of Jesus Christ because it's the golden link that uh, unites the divinity uh, with humanity. And so continued on, uh, we find in, uh, uh, in, the, in the message of righteousness by faith, uh, I'll just give a little history of uh, uh, this because uh, I thought that uh, this is important. Um, Little history of 1888, uh, Jadison Sylvanus uh, Washburn, who lived between 1863 to 1955. Uh, we read that uh, as, as we go through studies and see how this message is much important because um, it uh, really brings us to the, the issue of righteousness by faith. They just shall live by faith and uh, we can have victory over sin because the message of righteousness by faith or justification by faith is... Um, it tackles the issue of being imputed with the righteousness of God and then being imparted the righteousness of God. That Christ was um, a human being like us and by uh, holding the hand of the omnipotent, the Father, he was able to overcome sin. So humanity can also overcome sin. Now, let us go through a little history. Washburn was the son of a uh, Sabbatarian Adventist pioneer, Calvin Washburn, who had joined the Advent movement during the Millerite movement of the 1840s. As a youth, Jesh Washburn had many opportunities to meet the founding pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Washburn claimed a rich SDA heritage. He was converted by Jane Andrews at 11, baptized by James White at 12, and began preaching Adventism at 21. He worked in the Iowa Conference. It was from here that he came as a delegate to the 1888 General Conference session. The spiritual struggles that occurred at this meeting left him groping about his own spiritual life, a problem that he later sorted through uh, by counseling with um, Ellen White. About this time, he also began a correspondence with uh, Miss White that lasted through the rest of her life until her death in 1915. Rejuvenated spiritually by the message of righteousness by faith, Washburn went as a missionary to England. Up until that time, the work in England had been struggling, but uh, his creative tactics for drawing crowds and holding their attention 
literally changed the face of the church there from a small company of believers to literally hundreds who were converted at a time. There is evidence that uh, British Adventism may not have uh, survived, but for his contribution as a powerful and creative evangelist. In addition to his intense study of the spirit of prophecy and desire to obtain everything that Sister White wrote, Washburn's amazing memory enabled him to memorize much of the Bible and spirit of prophecy writings. By 1918, he claimed to have memorized Revelation, Romans, James, and 2 Peter. He noted that his memory improved with the study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy. By 1948, he claimed to have memorized the entire New Testament and was working toward committing Isaiah to memory. What a feat to achieve. Um, there is a most remarkable story regarding Washburn, 1888, and Ellen White. And um, continuing on, we are told J. Washburn was a nephew of G. George I. Butler, who was 26 years old in the year of 1888, the year when Brother Wagner and Jonas delivered the Adventist Church, uh, the special message of righteousness by faith. When he first heard the message, he rejected it because he felt that it was contrary to the established teachings of the Adventist Church concerning the law of God. Thus, he sided with Brother Uriah Smith and J. H. Morrison in their disavowal of the doctrine. It was during this time that he first realized that Sister White was in full agreement with Jonas and Wagon. This knowledge led him to question Miss White's position as the Lord's special messenger. After a short time of struggle, he met with Sister White and his doubts were dissolved. He later recalled, so I went to have a visit with her in her tent at the Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought and believed that she was a prophet, but I was disturbed by the Minneapolis episode. I had thought Uriah Smith and uh, J.H. Morrison were right. And uh, do you know why J.H. Morrison left the conference early? She asked me. I replied, yes. Then she told me just what Morrison had said to me and the revelation of her apparently superhuman knowledge of that private, confidential conversation frightened me. I realized that there was one who knew secrets. Sister White told me of her guide in Europe who had stretched his hands out and said, there are mistakes being made on both sides in this controversy. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference. The real issue is righteousness by faith. E. J. Wagner can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can, said Sister White. Why, Sister White? I said, do you mean to say that E. J. Wagner can teach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been wanting to bring it out more clearly, but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. This is a report of interview with Elder J. Schwarzman by R. J. Willan, June 4, 1950. With that synopsis of um, the 1888 story of uh, J. Schwarzman and uh, E.G. White, we can now dwell in this issue of the human nature of Jesus Christ at the standpoint of how it was being presented by um, uh, Brother E.J. Wagoner or Elder E.J. Wagoner in Christ and His Righteousness. And um, there, there has been uh, some uh, time that people have said, okay, Sister White says that every I don't agree with every interpretation of uh, uh, Brother E.J. Wagoner, but he seems honest and uh, 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 he has something that uh, is really, really unique. And so I, I'm just going to bring this to the forefront and uh, what you have to do is uh, uh, interact with the information, synthesize everything that you are going to read and be able to decide yourself. But my main point is to show that um, Christ was uh, uh, a human being and he did not rely on his divinity to overcome sin, but relied on the hand of omnipotent, that is the Father, to overcome sin. And that provision has been given to every human being. This is, was a most precious message that was to be brought to all the churches by the delegates who attended the 1888 General Conference. And um, because many of them were confused, um, many of them did not understand what to go and take, tell the people, Others rejected it, and a few of them accepted it. But we have an opportunity once again to go through these things and uh, be able to make a decision by ourselves. And so, um, I'll just go ahead and uh, uh, look at uh, the issue that are at stake. 
we are told in uh, 1SN 320 paragraph 1, the reason why I'm going through all this material and not just going direct to the Bible is that we may, there are people who have never read what happened in 1888. They are coming into this information. They are coming to meet this information right now. And uh, we are just doing a cut um, uh, that is copy paste. And uh, those are as if you are doing highlights of the thing. You can go back and read those material yourself, the 1888 materials and uh, the, the booklet surrounding that year, 1888, by E.J. Wagner and E.T. Jones. Uh, you can also do, go through the, the writings of uh, Professor Prescott and others who wrote uh, at that time. But uh, let us look at uh, some issues. And the commandments of God are comprehensive and far-reaching. In few words, they unfold the whole duty of man. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Mark 12, 30 and 31. In these words, the length and breadth, the depth and height of the law of God is comprehended. For Paul declares, love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 13, 10. The only definition we find in the Bible for sin is that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. The word of God declares, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. There is none that doeth good, no, no not one. Romans 3.12. Many are deceived concerning the condition of their hearts. They do not realize that the natural heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. They wrap themselves about with their own righteousness and are satisfied in reaching their own human standard of character. But um, how fatally they fail when they do not reach the divine standard and of themselves they cannot meet the requirements of God. That is one selected messages page 320, paragraph 1. Again, in uh, Faith and Works, page 108, paragraph 1, Beholding the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, he finds the peace of Christ, for pardon is written against his name, and he accepts the word of God, ye are completing him, Colossians 2.10. How hard is it for humanity, long accustomed to cherish doubt, to grasp this great truth, but what peace it brings to the soul, what vital life, in looking to ourselves for righteousness by which to find acceptance with God, we look to the wrong place. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We are to look to Jesus, for we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. You are to find your completeness by beholding the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so, remember the discussion or the presentation is Christ's human nature. And we are just first looking at whom to behold. Uh, all have seen and who are we to behold? We have to behold Jesus Christ himself. One is him, one selected message, 397, paragraph 4. Imputation of the righteousness of Christ comes through justifying faith and is the justification for which Paul so honestly contends. He says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yeah, we establish the law. Again in 6 BC 1095.4, if the transgressor is to be treated according to the letter of this covenant, then there is no hope for the fallen race. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you know that the wages of sin is death. And humanity cannot be able to bring anything that is equivalent to the demands of the law unless they go through Jesus Christ. And so his humanity is so important that we may understand that uh, he can empower us and give us the same power to be able to overcome sin. The fallen race of Adam can behold nothing else in the light of this covenant than the ministration of death. And death will be the reward of everyone who is seeking vainly to fashion a righteousness of his own that will fulfill the claims of the law. By his word, God has bound himself to execute the penalty of the law on all transgressors. 
again and again men commit sin and yet they do not seem to believe that they must suffer the penalty of breaking the law. Thus, wickedness that fills our world, Review and Herod, March 15, 6, paragraph 6, the wickedness that fills our world is the result of Adam's refusal to take God's word as supreme. He disobeyed and fell under the temptation of the enemy. Sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. God declared, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And apart from the plan of redemption, human beings are doomed to death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Christ gave his life to save the sinner from the death sentence. He died that we might live. To those who receive him, he gives power that enables them to separate from that which, unless they return to their loyalty, will place them where they must con be condemned and punished. God declared, the soul that sinned it shall die, Ezekiel 18.4. And apart from the plan of redemption, human beings are doomed to death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, Romans 3.23. But Christ gave his life to save the sinner from the death sentence. He died that we might live. To those who receive him, he gives power that enables them to separate from what which, from that which, unless they return to their loyalty, will place them where they must be condemned and punished. Christ is the sinner's only hope. By his death, he brought salvation within the reach of all. Through his grace, all may become loyal subjects of, the, of God's kingdom. Only by his sacrifice could salvation be brought within man's reach. This sacrifice has made it possible for men and women to fulfill the conditions laid down in the councils of heaven. In Science of the Time, February 20, 1893, Satan and his angels exulted as they discovered that the Son of God had taken upon himself the nature of man. Now, I want us to get the gist of the matter. Here is Satan rejoicing, but what is the rejoicing about? That Christ, the Son of God, has taken himself the nature of man, and had come to man's substitute to be man's substitute to engage in the conflict in our behalf. The human family had been overpowered by the uh, deception of the enemy for all have seen and come short of the glory of God and the enemy hope that Christ also will become a victim to his seductive words. Because he had taken upon himself the nature of man, Satan deemed that his victory was certain and with every malign and device in his power he strove to overcome Christ. So let us pause for a moment and talk about this. Here is Satan rejoicing that Christ has taken upon human nature and he believed that as he made Adam to sin, if Christ has taken upon his human nature, then he can be able also to overcome him. And this is the most important point, that Christ took our human na nature to demonstrate to the enemy, to demonstrate to Satan that human nature can be able to overcome sin. And this is the most important point of all the points when it comes to the study of uh, Christ's human nature. And so... Uh, the steadfast resistance of Christ to the temptations of the enemy brought the whole confederacy of evil to war against him. Evil men and evil angels united their forces against the prince of peace. The issues at stake were beyond the comprehension of men and the temptation that assailed Christ were as much more intense and subtle than those which assailed man or as his character was purer and more exalted than is the character of man in his moral and physical defilement. In his conflict with the prince of darkness in, his, in this atom of a world, Christ had to meet the whole confederacy of evil, the united forces of the adversary of God and man. But at every point he met the tempter and put him to flight. Christ was conqueror over the powers of darkness and took the infinite risk of consenting to war with the enemy that he might conquer him in our behalf. So the taking of Christ of human nature was to conquer the enemy on our behalf, so that no one may have an excuse that sin cannot be overcome. Uh, Science of the Time, June 20, 1895, paragraph 6. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and for this reason the Lord has provided a remedy for sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. 
The true test of religious experience is here given. He that abideth in Christ is affected in the love of God and his purposes, thoughts, words, and actions are in harmony with the will of God expressed in the commandments of his law. There is nothing in the heart of the man who abides in Christ that is at war with any precept of God's law. Where the spirit of Christ is in the heart, the character of Christ will be revealed, and there will be manifested gentleness under provocation and patience under trial. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Righteousness can be defined only by God's great moral standard, the Ten Commandments. There is no other rule by which to measure character. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. It was the refusal of Satan to obey the commandments of God that God sin and apostles in the universe. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, manifested that uh, he might destroy the works of the devil. Shaping iniquity, and uh, we, we want to just look at uh, different pioneers and what they had to talk about uh, the nature of man and the nature of Jesus Christ. This is S.M. Haskell in uh, Revealing Herald, October 12, 1900. This is not the way that men will naturally write a history of the ancestors of Christ. Even if we have inherited tenderness and appetites of the worst kind, there is hope. It was cried through David who said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This states plainly the nature of humanity in which Christ was conceived. I won't do interpretations of these things, and let us read and digest them. In um, Letter 2 to Ellen White, dated at Battle Creek, Michigan, September 25, 1900, S.M. Haskell had this to write to E.G. White. When we stated that we believe that Christ was born in fallen humanity, they will represent us as believing that Christ sinned. So there is always this tendency that when you say that Christ had a fallen humanity, then they will say that then Christ participated in sin and he cannot be uh, a, a substitute and a surety for our sin. But then as an Askel is saying that saying that Christ has was born in a fallen humanity that not equate to Christ being a sin. And so E.J. Wagner in Christ in his righteousness, page 26, paragraph 1, 1890, he says, Other scriptures that we will quote bring closer to us the fact of the humanity of Christ and what it means for us. We have already read that the word was made flesh, and now we will read that what Paul says concerning the nature of that flesh. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, I want to make a point uh, here, and uh, I hope uh, it makes sense with us. Christ had divine nature for atoning for sin. Christ had a human nature for our example that we can overcome sin. Now, if Christ did not have the human nature, then he could not be a demonstration for those who have the human nature. And if Christ did not bear sin in his human nature and overcome it, then there is no way those who have human nature can contend with sin and overcome it. And so it is important to understand this things that it hangs upon uh, our concepts and uh, the end result of what we believe, the logical end result of what we believe. If Christ did not have human nature, then there's no need of telling humanity that you can overcome sin. If he was did not conquer sin in human nature, then he conquered sin in the nature of uh, not humanity but other beings. And so um, humanity cannot be able to overcome sin because it is not their nature that overcomes sin. Uh, I hope uh, this comes clear that um, if he had another nature which actually he was tempted with and overcome, then that is not a representation of humanity, but a representation of that nature. And so human nature is exempted from being represented by Jesus Christ. Yet it will be absurd to say that human nature is not represented by Christ because it is for us that he came and died at uh, Calvary. And so... Just continued on. Uh, again, E.J. Uh, e. Wagner in Christ and His Righteousness, page 26, paragraph 2 and 27, paragraph 1, he says, 
A little thought will be sufficient to show anybody that if Christ took upon himself the likeness of man in order that he might redeem man, it must have been sinful man that he was made like. For it is sinful man that he came to redeem. Death could have no power over sinless man. As Adam was in Eden, and it could not have had any power over Christ if the Lord had not laid on him the iniquity of us all. Moreover, the fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of a sinful man, that is, that the flesh which he assumed had all the weaknesses and sinful tendencies to which fallen human nature subject, is shown by the statement that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. David had all the passions of human nature. He says of himself, we call, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And when you read the book of Romans chapter 1, we are told that he may, was made um, uh, according to the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, but through the spirit of holiness, he overcame sin. Uh, the following statement in the book of Hebrews is very clear on this point. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For verily not of angels though he take hold, but he taketh hold of the seed of Abraham. Uh, this is from the Revised Russian Bible. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, 16 to 18. Continued on in this book, page 27.2, 27.3, Christ and his righteousness. If he was made in all things like unto his brethren, then he must have suffered all the infirmities and been subject to all the temptation of his brethren. To more texts that are put this matter very possibly, will be sufficient evidence of this point. We first quote 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, God, hath made him Christ to be seen for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God unto him. And so the purpose of Christ having the human nature so that he may bear sin for us and we be made righteousness of God in him. Obviously, there is no other nature he could have taken for us to get the righteousness of God. This is much stronger than the statement that he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was made to be seen. Here is the same mystery as that the Son of God should die. The spotless, the spotless Lamb of God who knew no sin was made to be seen. Sinless yet not only counted as a sinner, but actually taking upon himself sinful nature. He was made to be seen in order that we may, might be made righteous men. So Paul says to the Galatians that God sent forth his Son, made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. In that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he said, able to succor them that are tempted. For we have not a high priest which cannot be tied to in the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 2, 14, 4, 15, and 16. In, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, E.J. Wagoner. Uh, and uh, allow me to do something here. Still continue just to see what is in the book Christ and and uh, Christ and His righteousness, and this is coming from the Gospel in the book of Galatians, the Gospel in the book of Galatians by E.J. Wagoner, page sixty, paragraph five, to page sixty-one, paragraph one, in Hebrews two nine. But we see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, might, he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He continues to say, this text show that Christ took upon himself man's nature, and that as a consequence he was subject to death. He came into the world on purpose to die, and so from the beginning of his earthly life he was in the same condition that the men are in whom he died to save. Now read Romans 1.3. The gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. 
What was the nature of David according to the flesh? Sinful, was it not? David says, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalms 51.5 Don't start in horrified astonishment. I am not implying that Christ was a sin. I shall explain more fully in a few moments, but first I wish to quote Hebrews 2.16 and 17. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Continue on in um, Gospel in the book of Galatians. He says, His being made in all things like unto his brethren is the same as his him, his being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, made in the likeness of men. One of the most encouraging things in the Bible is the knowledge that Christ took on him the nature of men to know that his ancestors, according to the flesh, were sinners. When we read the record of the lives of the ancestors of Christ and see that they had all the weaknesses and passions that we have, we find that no man has any right to excuse his sinful acts on the ground of heredity. And so you understand, E.G. White says that uh, he partook in all the laws of heredity. If Christ had not been made in all things like unto his brethren, then his sinless life would be no encouragement to us. We might look at it with admiration, but it will be admiration that will cause hopeless despair because he is not like us. And now as another parallel to Galatians 4, 4 and the further source of encouragement to us, I'll quote 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he had made him to be seen for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, now when was Jesus made sin for us? It must have been when he was made flesh and began to suffer the temptations and infirmities that are incident to sinful flesh. He passed through every phase of human experience, being in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Isaiah 53 verse 4. And this scripture is said by Matthew to have been fulfilled long before the crucifixion. So, I said that his being born under the law was a necessary consequence of his being born in the likeness of sinful flesh, of taking upon himself the nature of Abraham. He was made like man in order that he might undergo the suffering of death from the earliest childhood the cross was ever before him. And so, when uh, you consider the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 1, it talks Jesus Christ being in the form of God. When, and we cannot doubt that he was a lesser God when it says that he was in the form of God. And so when we go to Hebrews chapter 2, it speaks about the human nature of Jesus Christ. And we should not suppose he was any lesser human or any more human than any human being. As he was not any lesser God or any more God, but God in Hebrews chapter 1. So he is no lesser man or more man in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. In fact, um, I don't know if I put this on my notes, but uh, then uh, we are told that um, uh, uh, his, um, his human nature was created. Uh, uh, this is um, Christ triumphant page 213 paragraph 4 and uh, this is what um, we read and God as God he could not be tempted but as man he could be tempted and that strongly and could yield temptation his human nature must pass through the same test and trial Adam and Eve passed through his human nature was created. He did not even possess the angelic powers. It was human, identical with our own. He was passing over uh, the ground where Adam fell. He was no, now where, if he endured the test and trial in behalf of the fallen race, he would redeem Adam's disgraceful failure and fall in our humanity, in our humanity. A human body and a human mind were his. He was born of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Now, I want you to think about this because in the book of Genesis chapter 2, when Adam sees Eve, she says, this is now born of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now, 
Eve was not any lesser human being than Adam, neither was Adam any higher human being than Eve. And that is why he said, born of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And so if Christ was born of our bone and flesh of our flesh, he is no either higher being than we are in our humanity, nor lesser being than we are in our humanity. He was subject to disappointment and trial in his own home among his own brethren. He was not surrounded as in the heavenly courts with pure and lovely characters. He was compassed with difficulties. He, he was compassed with difficulties, sorry. He came into our world to maintain a pure sinless character and to refute Satan's lie that it was not possible for human beings to keep the law of God. So in our condition, in our nature, we can be able to keep the law of God by holding on the hand of omnipotent as he did. And so, uh, continued on. In and this is um eighty this is eighty Jonas this is American Sentinel I, I believe uh, in uh, in uh, American uh, Sentinel we. Read, uh, we read the following. The dogma, um, and uh, we end now in the people exempting Jesus Christ from the human nature or all that that it pertains to human nature. And uh, it John is explained something on uh, trying to exempt Jesus Christ from all this human nature. Alonzo Trevor John is. Uh, uh, in uh, American Sentinel, page 289, uh, 289, he says, The dogmatic term immaculate conception signifies that Mary was not shaped in iniquity and conceived in sin like the rest of humanity, Psalms 51.5. And this dogma logically followed the one previously proclaimed that Mary never committed a sin, notwithstanding the declaration of God that all have sinned. This unscriptural doctrine, which was infallibly proclaimed by Pope Pius, the, um, this is the ninth, uh, in 1854, is but one of a series of dogmatic decisions covering many centuries by which the mother of our Lord has been transformed into a goddess, crowned queen of the whole universe, one and seated on the right hand of Jesus to, to fill the first place after God in heaven, and on earth. Uh, the papal discussion of the question of immaculate conception, which was infallibly settled by Pope Pius IX, the, the eighth, uh, in 1854, was carried on for centuries between two powerful Roman Catholic societies. The Fran Franciscans, who violently favored it, and the Domin Dominicans, who violently opposed it. So furious and bitter was the contention that Pope uh, Sectus the fourth published a bull in 1483 threatening to send both parties to uh, hell if they did not stop calling one another heretics. At length, the Jesuits took sides with the Franciscans and secured the papal decision of 1854. So, uh, and the reason why these people had to go into all um, this stuff of uh, immaculate conception is uh, because they wanted to exempt Jesus Christ from the uh, human nature. They wanted to exempt Jesus Christ uh, from uh, uh, the human nature. But let us continue and see what uh, it Jonas uh, says uh, about uh, uh, what happened uh, at that time. Let us continue following uh, what uh, it's written by these messengers of righteousness by faith in 1888. Um, he continues to say, The opponents of the doctrines, besides declaring it to be unscriptural, asserted that it was absurd and said, On the same principle, you will be obliged to hold that the conception of our ancestors is in an ascending line was also a holy one, since otherwise she could not have descended from them holy. The logic of this objection is apparent and less met it will necessitate the immaculate conception of Mary's whole pedigree, which would include David, who speaking for the rest as well as for himself says, 
Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceal uh, me. And so this, these are the kinds of uh, argument that uh, we are having for and uh, the exempting of Jesus Christ from uh, the human nature that we have will necessitate not only Mary being exempted, but also the whole pedigree, the whole ancestry, uh, uh, the whole ancestry of uh, Mary, and even reaching back to, to David, even reaching back to David, so that he also may be shapen without iniquity in order to have Christ have a different nature than um, what we have. And so Alonzo Trevor Jones continues here on this issue of Christ uh, shapen in our nature. And uh, I'll share my screen. We read that uh, in order to he heed off this fatal logic, someone who was born in sin must let arise above this condition, be freed from human sinful flesh, after which from these superhuman bodies could be born immaculate or sinless flesh. So uh, those who are trying and those who are trying to free Jesus from having our nature say that uh, Mary had Mary. Uh, Jesus had immaculate conception, but if you go to immaculate conception, then it will not stop to Mary to do Jesus. It will go to Mary, and it will go to all his generation. So, in order to heed off this fatal logic that all this generation of Mary must have immaculate conception, this is how they argue: someone who was born in sin must let arise above his condition. So, you are yes, you are born in sin. Mary is born in sin. But he must rise above this condition, be freed from his sinful flesh, after which from these superhuman bodies could be born immaculate or sinless flesh. So Mary may come, must come to a place where his human flesh, his human sinful flesh is free from that state, from that nature, and he has a holy flesh. It sounds that like the holy flesh movement, and you can go back and watch the videos on holy flesh movement where they say that you should pass through the Gethsemane experience, then you have a holy flesh and everything that you do, it is now holy. So Roman Catholic tradition, which according to the teaching of the church is declared to be more clear and safe than the Bible, says that uh, Joachim and Anne were the parents of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it is by them we are told that the great feat of lifting the ancestry of Mary from sinful flesh to sinless flesh was accomplished. Of these traditional parents of Mary, it is stated that they showed themselves always so perfect in their whole contact that one need not marvel that from such a perfection should come forth the one whose luster is as the mirror of all goodness in ages past and to come. So the parents of Mary um, uh, these are uh, they were they, they walked um, more holy until they passed from a sinful flesh to a sinless flesh, and from that now Mary was born, and then now Christ was born a holy person. You you, you just meditate upon that. Uh, along the Trevor Jones says, but Saint Anne and so Joachim were not born sinless. How then was this perfection attained? Let the cardinal in those to work ask the same question and under it. By what gradation of virtues and perfection did she, St. Anne, raise herself to make this thing possible, of having sinless flesh, so that Christ may be born a sinless person, uh, or with a nature that is not uh, like ours. Let us remember what Mary was from the first instant of our creation, and we shall then be able to form an idea of what must have been her mother. Must not the stem be worthy of the flower and the vase worthy of the perfume it contains? On leaving the hands of God, still under the actions of his creating breath, the soul of Mary was joined to a most pure body, forever virginal and immaculate like itself. However, Holy Joachim and Anwar at the time of their marriage, they were not yet sufficiently so to give such a daughter as Mary to the world. By multiplying their fasts, 
their alms through so many long years in order to obtain this grace from God's goodness, they made rapid progress in perfection and in the love of God, and at length arrived at that degree of purity and holiness desired by the Holy Ghost. Thus, mortification and sacrifice had done their work in St. Anne and St. Joachim, purifying, refining, and not leaving in them even the shadow of defilement. God could take of that pre-sanctified earth to create his well-beloved daughter, who after God sees none superior or equal to herself, either in holiness, in glory, or in power, purer than angels, holier than the archangels. Do you notice, reader, something? After the parents of Mary going through what we call the Gethsemane experience, they were born in the nature that we have, a fallen nature, fallen human nature. But through mortification, through alms, through prayers, through fasting, they reached to a point where they obtained a sinless flesh. And then when it came to giving birth to Mary, then she was given immaculate conception. And what state was she in? Pure than any, pure, holier than any holy, and holier than even angels. I want you to just see this. How men go beyond what is written. She was superior, equal. She, she, she was, she had none superior or equal to herself, neither in holiness, in glory, in power, purer than angels, holier than archangels. So if Mary is purer than angels and holier than archangels, then do you know what? There's something that we have to conclude here. Mary was not created lower than angels. What does that do to the Bible? It contradicts the Bible that human beings were created lower than angels. If Mary is lower than the angels and holier than the angels, then he is having a higher nature than the angels. And for what reason? So that she may be able to give birth to Jesus Christ, who will have also not the same nature that human beings have. Alonzo Trevor Jones continues on page 289, but why all these theological disputes and furious contentions and papal bulls and anathema and infallible decisions in the Roman Catholic Church concerning the Immaculate Conception of Mary and Immaculate Purity of St. Anne and St. Joachim? It was to sanctify the royal blood when our Savior was to be born. Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was to form the divine flesh. Think about that. Saint Anne. So the divinity of Jesus Christ actually was given by Mary. If you look at that statement clearly, Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was to form the divine flesh. So Christ did not have the human flesh. Christ did not have the fallen human nature. Christ did not have the likeness of the sinful human being. He had a divine flesh. This is what is being taught when you reject the issue that Christ had our nature. So Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was to form the divine flesh. Now, if uh, Christ had a divine flesh, how could that flesh be tempted with the human passions and feel anything. It is nothing. It is like taking a stick and striking on the metal. What will it cause to the metal? Nothing. And so if Christ had a divine flesh out of immaculate conception, then seeing he could not be tempted in the way we are tempted because his flesh is not our flesh. And you know that the Catholic Church says that they are above the Bible. They are inspired more than the Bible. And this is what happens not only with the Roman Catholics, but even with us when we think that what we understand is more than what has been written in the Bible. So Christ having a divine flesh, there is no way he can be an, a, be an example. And you can require any human being to overcome sin in the human nature because that is not the nature that Christ overcame sin in. Those are the consequences of believing that Christ did not have our nature. And so, 
Um, I repeat, it was to sanctify the royal blood when our Savior was to be born. Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was to form the divine flesh. We are told in inspiration that a divine spirit dwelt in the temple of flesh. Not divine flesh, but the flesh that we have. Saint Anne and Joachim are represented as making themselves immaculate because the blood of Joachim and Anne, passing through the most pure heart of Mary, was to become the blood of Jesus. After the storm of contention is over and the Franciscans and Jesuits have won, and the turn of the Vatican vanished, uh, and the turn of the Vatican finished the creation of our Savior, what do we behold? We see a Savior whose blood was purified by mortification and sacrifice of his grandparents, and whose divine flesh was formed by the blood made purer than the angels, holier than the archangels, through his grandmother and grandfathers, multiplying their fast, their alms, and good works. Let us see. Oh, how this frustrates the grace of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now you see the grandparents of Mary can boast because they have a holy blood which they earned by fasts and mortification of body and all these things. It is not coming from Christ anymore, but from their works. And that is why the whole Roman Catholic doctrine of justification is based on works and not by faith. And that is why we have penance, we have um, uh, uh, what we call um, uh, purgatory, where they can pay for you when you are there and then you are admitted in heaven. And all this stuff, because it is righteousness by works and not by faith. And this righteousness by work is what attained, uh, uh, gave their parents a holy place to transmit to their uh, grandchild. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Instead of creating Christ Jesus by mortification and sacrifice, by multiplying fast and good works, the Christian is created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Instead of saving our Savior by our works, we are saved by our Savior from our works. And so the Catholic doctrines of Christ's nature, actually it is humanity saving Jesus Christ rather than Christ saving humanity. And instead of his being the workmanship of our work, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Again, this anti-Christian savior is represented as clothed, not with the sinful flesh of Abraham, but with the divine flesh, purer than the angels and holier than the archangels. The papal savior is therefore so high above man who is shaped in iniquity and clothed with sinful flesh that it takes a ladder reaching from us to heaven to touch him. He is so far removed from fallen men that it requires a bridge to span the abyss which separates him from his Savior. This is not only the logical deduction from the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary and the Immaculate Lives of St. Anne and St. Joachim, but it is admitted doctrine and daily practice of the Roman Catholic Church. Here it is. And he says that uh, she, Anne, is the mother of her who is purer than the angels and holier than the angels, higher than the thrones, more powerful than the dominions, more enlightened than the cherubims, more inflamed with the divine love than the seraphims. She is the mother of who of her who is called and who is the eldest daughter of the father, the true mother of the son, the spouse of the Holy Ghost. Think about Jesus, uh, Mary being the spouse of the Holy Ghost, which means that the Holy Ghost is the husband of Mary. She is the mother of her who is full of grace, of her who has bestowed and still bestows random on the captive, strength to the weak, sight to the blind, consolation to the afflicted, hope to the desponding, an overflow of joy to the angels, human flesh to the divine one, a wash for worth of his greatness to the eternal father, a temple worth of his holiness to the Holy Ghost. Anne is the mother of her who is ladder to heaven, the anchor of the ship, wrecked the star of the marina, the bridge whereby God crossed the abyss which separated us from him. And so Mary is higher in rank more even by to Jesus because Christ is an archangel and we are told that Mary is holier than archangels. Think about this doctrine of immaculate conception and sparing Jesus Christ from our nature. 
it makes Mary holier than the archangels, as Etijonis says. And Christ is an archangel. So what do we mean? Mary should be our atoning sacrifice and not Jesus Christ, by the way. Away with your Mary ladder, Etijonis says, and Immaculate Bridge. Jesus Christ is the ladder and is the lowermost round reach, and it is lowermost round reaches as low as the lowest sinner. In order that he might reach sinful men, verily he took on him the nature of the verily he took on him the natures of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For so much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. What? Part of man's sinful flesh? Yeah, verily. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. For we have no unhigh priest which cannot be tied with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace without the purple ladder that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. And so uh, Trevor continues, and now Pope Leo the 13th has uh, the uh, this is Pope Leo the 12th has the hardihood to invite us away from this Savior who is so close to us that he dwells in us and condemns sin our sinful flesh as he condemns sin in the sinful flesh which he inherited from his Mary. He calls us away from this Savior to a Savior who was born from immaculate flesh, purer than the angels, holier than archangels, and who therefore cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities and must be touched with the ladder. He calls us to a Savior so widely separated from us that there must be a bridge contrasted to span the chasm. And he asks us to trust our eternal life to this human structure whose spans are made of fast and mortifications and good works. And besides inviting us to trust our salvation to this phantom bridge, he demands toll for the passage of our soul at every span of it is almost limitless length. While our Savior without money and without Christ freely reaches over the betterments of heaven and with and while holding fast to the throne of the infinite with the arm of omnipotence and supports us with his long human arm, that arm that is not shortened, that it cannot save, and presses us lovingly to that bosom that is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He being in our nature can be able to succumb, can be able to hold us and understand what we are going through in real time, in reality. And now, instead of accepting the invitation of Pope Leo XII, we, on the contrary, invite with the words of our Savior, him and all his deluded followers who are trusting for salvation to human ladders and bridges, and all others who know not our Lord, come unto me, all who that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in spirit, and you shall find rest unto your soul. This is the invitation to Pope Leo the Twelve and all those who hold unto the doctrine of that Pope. Come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden that will give you rest. And the spirit and the bride says, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is at thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take off the water of life freely. Away from the, 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 the Jesus that these people have created. And let us take upon Jesus Christ. It Jonas tells us now as to Christ not having like passion with us. In the scripture all the way through his, he is like us and with us according to the flesh. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the seed of David according to the flesh. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't go too far. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in the likeness of sinful mind. Do not drag his mind into it. His flesh was our flesh, but the mind was the mind of Christ Jesus. This is what A.T. John is, is really telling us, and uh, I'd just like to share it uh, so that uh, we may read together in uh, 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 General Conference Bulletin, page 327. He says, now as to Christ not having like passion with us, in scripture, all the way through, he is like us and with us according to the flesh. He is the seed of David and according to the flesh. 
He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't go too far. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in the likeness of sinful mind. That is why we are told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. We are not told, let this flesh that was with Christ be with you. We are told, let this mind. Do not drag his mind into it. His flesh was our flesh, but the mind was the mind of Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is written, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he had taken our mind, how then could we ever have been exhorted to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? It would have been so, it would have been so already. But what kind of mind is ours? Oh, it is corrupted with sin also. Look at ourselves in the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse and reading to the third, but the third verse is the one that has this particular point in it. Our minds have consented to sin. We have felt the enticement of the flesh and our minds yielded. Our minds consented and did the wills and the desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The flesh leads and our minds have followed, and with the flesh the law of sin is served. When the mind can live, the law of God is served. But as our minds have surrendered yielded to sin, they have themselves become sinful and weak and are led away by the power of sin in the flesh. Now, the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh, and in it was all that is our flesh. All the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh were in his flesh, going upon him to get him to consent to sin. Suppose he had consented to sin with his mind. What then? Then his mind would have been corrupted, and then he would have become of like passions with us. But in that case, he himself would have been a sinner. He would have been entirely enslaved and we all would have been lost. Everything would have perished. And so, um, as we bring this to a close, Seth was of more noble structure than Cain or Abel and resembled Adam more closely than did his other sons. He was a worthy character following in the steps of Abel, yet he inherited no more natural goodness than did Cain. Concerning the creation of Adam, it is said, in the likeness of God made he him. But man after the fall begat a son in his own likeness after his image. While Adam was created sinless in the likeness of God, Seth like kind inherited the fallen nature of his parents. But he received also the knowledge of the Redeemer and instruction in righteousness. By divine grace he served and honored God. And he labored as Abel would have done had he lived to turn the minds of sinful men to revere and obey their creator. But not to any class in Christ's love is, is Christ's love restricted. He identified himself with every child of humanity. That we might become members of the heavenly family, he became a member of the earthly family. He is the son of man, and thus a brother to every son and daughter of Adam. His followers are not to feel themselves detached from the perishing world around them as the Catholic people, bulls, actually declare. They are part of the great web of humanity and heaven looks upon them as brothers to sinners as well as to saints. So there are other people who say that he was made like his brethren, those brethren who are not sinners, but those who have been converted. But here we are told that his humanity, he looks upon them as brothers to sinners as well as to the saints because he has their nature. The fallen, the erring, and the sinful, Christ's love embraces and every deed of kindness done to uplift a fallen soul, every act of mercy is accepted as done to him. The human will of Christ will not have led him to the wilderness of temptation to fast and be, to be tempted of the devil. It will not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering, and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as ours shrinks from them. He endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. The contrast between the life and character of Christ and our life and character is painful to contemplate. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of his heavenly Father. Christ left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Are we doing it? In their conflict with Satan, the human family has all the help that Christ had. They need not to be overcome. They may be more than conquerors through him who has loved them and given his life for them. The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fears, apparently overwhelming temptation that assail us, temptation to indulge of appetite to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Everyone will be tempted, but the world, the world declares that we, should, we shall not be tempted above our ability to bear. We may resist and defeat the wily foe. Bear in mind that Christ overcoming and obedient is that of a true human being. 
in our conclusion, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that it's not possible for man to have in his conflict with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. His imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith. The obedience of Christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of man. And as God, he could not be tempted, but as man, he could be tempted. We are told that his human nature was identical with our own. He did not possess angelic host, uh, angelic powers we have read. It was created and a human body and a human mind was his. Our Lord was tempted as man is tempted. He was capable of yielding to temptation as a human being. His finite nature was pure and spotless. But the divine nature that led him to say to Philip, he that has seen me, hath seen the Father also was not humanized. Neither was humanity deified by the blending or union of the two natures. Each retained its essential character and properties. But here we must not become in our ideas common and earthly. In our perverted ideas, we must not think that the liability of Christ to yield to certain temptation degraded his humanity and he possessed the same sinful corrupt propensities as man. And so this is the most wonderful message. This is the message that the Lord designed that it should be given. And uh, uh, how I just pray that uh, we may not go uh, and uh, give him a nature uh, that uh, uh, is beyond what the Bible reveals that uh, is his nature. And so when we do that, we completely destroy his uh, nature and we come to a point that uh, we do not see that victory over sin is possible. When we ascribe a nature that is more than the nature that we have, actually we miss the mark and uh, we give up in life and we continue sinning until Jesus Christ. And so I pray that this uh, snippet of presentation may um, go, may help us to go search for the truth as a hidden treasure. And uh, we may settle in truth and be sure that we are not espousing the Roman Catholic doctrines. And so just uh, I'll uh, finish where I started by reading this as uh, we pray that um, the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where upon thou standest is a holy ground. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. Youth Instructor, October 13, 1898, paragraph 6. And so may um, the good Lord bless us and uh, may we in our continued study of the word of God know that um, he doesn't require of us that uh, which uh, uh, it is impossible for us to render, but in his son, we can be able to accomplish that which has a purpose for us to accomplish. And when we look at Jesus Christ, we are looking at humanity that is like unto us, was able to live our life and overcame, and we can be assured that also we can overcome. Shall we pray? Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and thank you for your loving kindness. If we have spoken anything that is in error and it may make one stumble, Lord, we pray that you may correct in their hearts these things. But if this is the truth, help us to grasp it and uh, to believe it and to continue in it. In Jesus' name, amen. And so God bless you. Until next time, bye for now.